What is the faculty termed imagination? Well, there are so many meanings for that that it is impossible to take it up now. There is the imagination that is a waste of time, that is idle dreaming. conjuring up probably of improbabilities, but there is also the imagination that permits one to see beyond that which is visible. There is also the imagination that can vision beyond even the possible. It takes imagination for an Admiral Peary to believe that he can reach the North Pole. It isn't idle dreaming, but it is imagination because according to human sense and human reason, this is in the realm of the impossible. There are other phases of imagination. Even to the extent of faculties active in a person who is a dreamer. A dreamer has a vivid imagination, but actually the only worthwhile things that have ever been accomplished in the history of the world have been accomplished by dreamers. As much as the world doesn't like them or respect them, and they must be dreamers. They must have vivid imaginations before they can accomplish, because there must be a goal beyond that which has ever been accomplished, that they must first vision dream about before they can get on the road to attainment. And so imagination can come into experience in so many different ways and not all of them worthwhile. What is the real function of germs, bacteria, viruses and so forth? I really don't know. And I mean it. I don't know. I have the faintest idea. I don't even know if there are such things. It is just uh, actually I know very little about this uh, physical thing. All of these things that come under the heading of physiology and biology and all the rest of these things might just as well be Sanskrit as far as I'm concerned. They're far beyond my imagination. And I've never understood them, and uh, I don't think I've had too much interest in trying. There too, you see, <clears throat> I have lived more or less in the dream world, trying to find that which is invisible, that which is unknowable. And I've had no interest in this tangible experience except in the measure that it should show forth the harmony of what we discover in this other world. No, I really, all these things, anatomy, all the rest of these, they're Greek. Will you speak on the subject of holidays? How are they to be interpreted and observed from a spiritual standpoint? For instance, Thanksgiving. Of course, that could be Christmas or Fourth of July or the President's birthdays. Here we come to really a beautiful experience, but it becomes necessary to accept what some of our friends would call duality. The Master prayed that the disciples 
be left in the world, but not of it. And uh, as you know, right from the beginning, that has been my vision, the Word made flesh. Not to leave this world, to be right in it, but not to be subject to its false laws, but rather to open ourselves to uh, reality and watch that reality made evident in visible form. So it is when we come to these holidays. Now, <clears throat> we realize, of course, that the origin of Thanksgiving was the fact that the pilgrims had come into this land of seeming lack and stress, and yet at this particular time had demonstrated their needs met in many different ways, and uh, they offered thanks. Actually, we don't know whether that really happened because Thanksgiving holiday came into existence after even their grandchildren weren't around. So that we do not know whether the Thanksgiving actually was celebrated by the pilgrims or whether it was a later invention ascribed to them. But it really makes no difference because the idea itself is good. They were in this cold, barren country and surrounded by warring in, uh, Indians, and yet through all of their hardships these daily needs were met, and it is logical to believe that a time came when someone would call this to their attention and remind them of how much they had to be thankful for and that there may have been some such ceremony, and then later it is incorporated as a national holiday. Now, as far as we are concerned, we have no feeling of emotion about the pilgrims and what they had or their thanksgiving. Therefore, the holiday for us today is only an opportunity for us to be reminded of the fact that we too have uh, much for which to be thankful. It is really an opportunity for a Sabbath day, a day of quiet, a day of peace, a day of reflection and uh, rejoicing. And on the human scale, nothing can be greater than a real observance of such a holiday. It is very much like the scriptural statements, lean not unto thine own understanding, acknowledge him in all thy ways. And of course, such an occasion would be an acknowledging of God as the source of our good. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. And here for a whole day we have this opportunity of pondering the infinite nature and the divine nature of that which is supplying this earth and all those that are in it. But this type of worship is a minor thing in comparison to the spiritual interpretation of uh, thanksgiving. Firstly, because spiritually understood thanksgiving cannot 
be confined to a day, a week, or a month. Thanksgiving is a state of consciousness, and it has to become a permanent sta uh, uh, state. Now, until we, as spiritual students, realize that there cannot be such a thing as a minute of the day or the night when somewhere within us there isn't a thanksgiving, a giving of thanks, a recognition or acknowledgement of the spiritual source and activity of all being. I can't conceive of living long without the eyes hitting some form of beauty, some form of supply, some form of nature, some form of good, without it bringing up inside of one a deep sense of thanks that these things are so. I think of this particularly when uh, I'm seeing the sky, or the ocean, or the farmlands, or these tremendous greens, trees, plants, flowers. Here you can't escape the vision of God appearing in infinite form and variety, in infinite abundance, in infinite joy and peace. And uh, how, how that could impinge itself on one without bringing to light a sense of thanks, of thanksgiving, of gratitude, of rejoicing, I don't know. Now, a barren heart would be one that does not consciously become aware of God's glory as it is being made manifest in our human experience. For the world, it is the most wonderful thing to have a day of thanksgiving because the world is barren. It is almost soulless. It doesn't observe these infinite beauties, these infinite harmonies, these infinite graces, the world as a world. It gets to where it takes them so for granted, and then more than likely believes some man is responsible for this, that, or the other thing, and uh, doesn't really bring to their inner awareness a feeling, an emotion of love, of gratitude, of joy. And so that day becomes a day, at least one out of the year, when something within may be stirred, and usually is by church services and newspaper and other programs, and it serves its purpose, that particular day would have no meaning for a mystic, no meaning whatsoever, for the simple reason that it would be more like a sacrilege to name one day as a day of thanks, just as it is a sacrilege to have a Sabbath day in the week. This to a mystic is a, is a mystery. How? We can have a Sabbath day in the week. Every day is a Sabbath day. Every day has to be held holy. Every day has to be a, an acknowledgement of God as the source, the law, the being. Every day has to be a day of rest. Because in our spiritual life, we're always resting. There's nothing to worry about. We know that God is running the universe. God is leading us beside the still waters. God makes us to lie down in green pastures. 
God sets a table for us in the wilderness, and even in the valley of the shadow of death, God is there to see us through. So we can go through life performing our functions and resting. Now, <clears throat> resting has nothing to do with the body because the body has no right to ever rest unless it be for a few minutes or hours of sleep. Aside from that, the body should be active as the mind should be active, but it should rest in that activity. Work is the finer kind of rest there is, both for the mind and for the body. And to have no work to do is punishment. To have no work to do is the next thing to a crime. Now, spiritually understood then, our lives are lives of thanksgiving because of our acknowledgement, continuous acknowledgement, of the source of that which is appearing visibly. Our lives are made up of seven Sabbath days every week, seven days every week in which our conduct must be holy, in which our aims and ambitions must be holy, in which our desires must be holy. And uh, it is the holiness that makes it the Sabbath and the resting from fears, worries, doubts, anxieties. We can trace every holiday in the same way. Christmas Day, which according to our human idea of holiday, is a reminder of the birth of the Christ. Actually, aside from the uses that are made of Christmas today, I can't see how it is any more important what day Jesus was born on or your great-grandfather. But if it makes the world have one day in the year for thinking thoughts of piety, gratitude, remembrance, if it turns this man world to the remembrance of religious subjects one day a year, then Christmas plays a noble part in the life of mankind. But for the spiritual student, the 25th of December isn't any different than the 2nd of September because what is it that has placed us on the spiritual path? What is keeping us on the spiritual path? What is it that is performing the miracles of our lives? The healings, the supply, the human relationships, the companionships, the spiritual uplift, what is it if it isn't the Christ? Man of himself can't do it. Even Jesus acknowledged that I can of my own self do nothing. And certainly again every mystic has acknowledged that but for this activity of a spirit within, they couldn't perform their works. Well certainly Every healer, practitioner, regardless of what their school may be, must certainly acknowledge that if it weren't for something transcendental, something beyond the grasp of their mind or reason, they couldn't be healing. They couldn't be. And this isn't only true in spiritual healing, this is true in medical healing. I doubt very much if there is a medicine or an operation that will ever cure anyone separate and apart from the consciousness of the individual performing 
the work. It isn't really as funny as it sounds when you hear someone speak of a doctor's bedside manners, because what is implied is uh, that spirit of love, that spirit of confidence, that spirit of assurance, that spirit of dedication, without which I doubt very much that any medicine would be effective, because medicine in and of itself has no power. It has to be the consciousness of the individual behind it. And so it is, whether we are spiritually healing or somebody else is medically healing, it is an act of Christ. It is Christ in consciousness. Do you believe for a minute that there would be a dedicated life on earth, a life dedicated to anything if it was up to man whose breath is in his nostril? No. No, a dedication comes from the activity of the Christ, the activity of the presence of God in the consciousness of an individual, even if they do not recognize it. That is what is behind it. And therefore, we are witnessing not only the birth of the Christ, there can't actually be a birth of the Christ, there can be a moment in which it is made evident in our consciousness. And for this reason, then, Every day of the week is December 25th. To an individual who realizes that every act of good that is performed anywhere on earth, any act of service, unselfish service, dedication, is really not man. It is the activity of the Christ as it is expressed in individual consciousness. To the world, it is absolutely fitting that we have a day in the year to remember the birthdays of our presidents, more especially of those few who have been great presidents, because their lives have been lives of dedication, and the few who ever attain the reputation for greatness must certainly have overcome tremendous temptations to be in a political office and still perform acts of service that all may benefit by. So to remember the president's birthday again is merely to have a day of thankfulness for the dedicated lives of those men who have brought this country to its greatness. But they have the same thing in England. They celebrate the Queen's birthday. And the Queen's birthday isn't any more important than your birthday or mine. But the Queen symbolizes the head of state. And it symbolizes a life of dedication. It symbolizes what every head of state if they aren't, should be. And therefore, in celebrating that, it merely gives the population of unthinkers an opportunity to have one day at least, at least to say thank you for a life of dedication. You know, on our trips over to England, I read the Times every morning to see the Queen's schedule for that day. And I'll tell you right now, I wouldn't trade places with her. There's hard labor without union hours or union pay. It really is. They keep her on the job from early morning to late at night. That is dedication. And people should have an opportunity during the year to remember, to respect, to honor. For us, that isn't necessary. For us, it must be clear that every day in the week we are thinking either of a president or a secretary or a cabinet minister or some foreign uh, uh, officer of government and uh, realizing 
that they are instruments through which freedom, liberty, justice are being maintained on earth. Man left to himself would never maintain it. It would slip away from him in 24 hours. But it is because there are always, especially now in the free countries, there are always those dedicated to preserving freedoms, justice, equity. And in the countries that are not free, there are also people not only living but dying to bring back the freedoms that people have lost. And how can we have a day with the newspapers the way they are how can we have a day without being conscious of that fact and again dedicating at least one minute of respect and thought to those who are so dedicating themselves. Fourth of July, a day in which freedom is proclaimed. So far as the world is concerned, its only value is, if it does remind anyone of the fact that they were given f freedom and that they're now letting it slip away from them and they'd better awaken. But we ought to have four Fourth of Julys in this country so that there'd be four times the amount of reminders that we did have people in this land to give us freedom, fight for it and die for it, and uh, inspire us to at least keep it. For us in this work, that isn't necessary. Every day of the week is a Fourth of July because the greatest thing we have gained from our study is freedom spiritual freedom. We have attained freedom from fears, freedom from most diseases, freedom from fear of death. We all know we're going to leave this plane one day. We know right well if there's a God, there must be a God there as well as a God here. There can't be a dividing line for infinity. And so it is then that the greatest quality the greatest activity that ever comes into the experience of a spiritual student is freedom. We live free of theological domination. We're even free of the law. By obeying it, we stay more completely free, and we obey it more as spiritual students than would otherwise have been the case. We are free, even if it's only in a measure, of the fear of lack and of the experience of lack. Our entire work is attaining freedom. The whole mission of the Christ is to set us free. So therefore, we need no Fourth of July. Every day has to be Fourth of July in which we rejoice in our freedom and in which we remember how it is attained and how we can bestow it on those who come to us. What is it we do as practitioners or teachers when patients or students or learners come to us? What do we do since we don't know anatomy and physiology and biology? We don't know medicine and we don't know surgery. What do we do except set them free? We set them free from their physical worries, we set them free from economic worries, we set them free from theological worries. The greatest freedom that comes to a spiritual student is he knows he isn't going to go to hell. And he's the only one who knows it. All the rest of the world is looking forward with dread to that horrible experience of what it may be. But not the spiritual student. The spiritual student knows the only hell he can ever know is the one that he creates. And he can just as well have it here as hereafter. And he can just as well get free of it here as hereafter. Our entire work is bringing freedom to those 
who come to a message like this. And how then can uh, we wait for 4th of July? Of course we don't. One thing we all learn in this work, I don't believe that there is any walk of life at all where there is more gratitude, more love, more sharing, more honoring than in this work. None. I am sure that there is no other endeavor on earth, no other phase or facet of society where so much gratitude and so much love and so much joy is expressed as in spiritual work. And why? Because really, the only thing anyone ever has to be thankful for is freedom. And nothing else is worthwhile without freedom. And with freedom, everything else is added. And therefore, freedom is really the whole of a spiritual activity. So it is, while we are in this world, like the disciples were, let us celebrate these holidays. And let us encourage the rest of the world to do likewise. Only for us, let us not limit it to those days, but remember that there are 365 days in the year, and every one of them is equal to each other. And therefore, each one has to include the 4th of July and the 25th of December, and uh, the last Thursday in Thanksgiving, and the President's birthdays, and our parents' birthdays too. That's a pretty good day to celebrate. Yes. Yes, I get thrills out of these holidays. I get thrills even in observing them as they are humanly observed, merely from the standpoint of remembering that even to those who ordinarily wouldn't be turning their thought to the higher message, this one day, in some degree, they all do. I'm all for holidays. I'm closing schools. I can close them all on holidays for me. Now, this is what's in my mind. Don't let me do you a disservice, which I could easily do if you do not make an effort to understand me correctly, or if you do not insist that I clarify the situation so that you understand it. I have said to you that the ancients were absolutely right in setting up a devil or Satan. They were absolutely right in understanding that there is an impersonal source of evil which tempts us, which comes to us as temptation and which never bothers us unless we succumb to the temptation. The mistake they made was setting up the devil as an opposite of God, an opponent of God, and thereby giving God an eternal warfare, an eternal attempt to get rid of the devil without ever being able to succeed. Had they understood that this devil or impersonal source of evil was not power, had no law, no life, no cause, they would have freed all of us. And then, verily, every day in the week would have been 4th of July. Now, in the same way, the earliest of our metaphysical teachers were absolutely right when they set up mortal mind and called it the sum total of all error or the source of all error but where they made their mistake 
They set it up as an opposite of divine mind. And they gave us such statements as, mortal mind causes disease, but divine mind cures it. That's a nice battle too, if divine mind wins. You see, anything that sets up an opposition to God cannot be truth. God is infinite, and God has nothing and nobody to war with. God is infinite. God is all. And there is no other power opposing God. Therefore, in proportion as you can treat this devil or mortal mind, not as something that you must have a deep understanding to overcome, not as something that you must go to God for, to have God's help, as you can understand it not in the sense that you have to pray to get rid of it or overcome it, but when you can understand it as it actually is, A mental projection without substance, cause or law, a mental projection without identity, individuality, being, substance, then you can follow this with exactly what the Hebrews did on one occasion, rest in this word, rest, relax from mental anxiety. Relax from mental labor, as if you had to overcome evil, or as if you had to contact God to do it for you, or as if you had to bribe God with a tithe. Oh, tithing's a wonderful thing, but for heaven's sakes, don't do it to please God. And don't do it in the idea that God is going to reward you for it. Because it'll fool you and it won't happen. Tithing is a free gift to any impersonal or spiritual purpose. Tithing is a free gift of love with no strings on it. But the very moment you think of it in connection with God, you're thinking of it as a virtue. You're thinking of it as a way to help you to overcome this evil, or one of its forms, or more than one of its forms. Therefore, we in the infinite way, having seen the nothingness of devil or Satan, having seen the nothingness of carnal mind or mortal mind, Please do not let us invent some other term and then say, oh, help me get rid of my illusion. Don't do that. Don't set up another power uh, against God and then want God to do something about it, or you'll just be back in theology or old-fashioned metaphysics. There is only one power, and if the infinite way is to perform a function in your life, it can only succeed if and in proportion as you can understand the nature of this carnal or mortal mind as a mental nothingness, an illusion, a mental projection, a temptation, a belief, a suggestion, and then drop it, drop it. Harmony comes into your experience, inner peace only can come into your experience in the realization of God as the only power. So that you can look out at the sins, diseases, deaths, lacks, and limitations that are frightening this world and realize that the only reason they're doing it is they're being accepted as power. The only reason 
they're perpetuating themselves is that they are being feared and fought. I bring you back over and over and over again to the Master's teaching of resist not evil, of put up thy sword. Over and over I come back to it so that you may study those passages and ask yourself, why did he say resist not evil? And you must come to the conclusion that if he could heal blindness with spittle, that evil isn't very much of a power. If he could make the lame walk merely by saying what did hinder you, then lameness can't be a law. In the infinite way, you break the spell, the mesmeric sense, which causes you to war or to seek a higher power with which to destroy a lesser power. You break that sense. That is the major point of the infinite way, that we are not another method of having God do something for us, another system of a greater power destroying a lesser power, that we in this work have come to the realization of one power and of the illusory nature of everything that is presenting itself to us as power. This doesn't mean that in the, probably a whole human span that we will demonstrate this to its fullest extent. Probably not. There's no history of anyone ever having accomplished it in full, not even the master. But it is the ultimate of our spiritual existence. It is the ultimate of our existence when we have transcended the cross, the tomb, the body that bleeds because a knife has been thrust into it, when we have ascended above that to the realization of our spiritual identity and our spiritual body, then we will have the opportunity of witnessing this in its fullness. Paul reminds us not to claim that we have attained the realization of this, the demonstration of this in its fullness. Let us be awfully thankful for whatever measure we have already seen, witnessed, and benefited by. Let us be grateful, at least we know the principle. And if our particular aeroplane is only flying a hundred miles an hour and for only one hour, let us at least be grateful that since we know the principle, we can keep on working with it until our plane flies around the world at a thousand miles an hour. In other words, it makes no difference how small our demonstration is today. The tiniest demonstration is a proof of the principle. From then on, it is only the developing of our consciousness, the increasing of the depth and uh, the scope until we perform the greater works. And then someday, at the point of ascension, the greatest works. The main thing is, not the degree of your demonstration, the degree of your awareness of what the principle is that is to be demonstrated. And the principle that is to be demonstrated is that God, <coughs> God in the midst of us is not only mighty, but the only mightiness there is. Not that God is a great power that is going to do tremendous things for us, but that God is the only power and nothing need be done for us. The realization of the greatest truth ever revealed, thou couldst have no power over me unless it came from God. What did hinder you? Pick up your bed and walk. As we abide in that principle, as we apply it, 
to every facet and every phase of our human existence, we develop a greater consciousness of it and thereby a greater demonstration of it. Please, above all things, as you read these writings and over and over and over again come to such statements as nature of error, carnal mind, mortal mind, please don't be frightened by them as if they were something you had to overcome, but remember that they are terms for something you don't need to overcome. They are terms for that which is nothingness. And when you read them, have the same feeling about them that you would have about a soap bubble, a nothingness. Now, maybe it would be a good idea to change all those terms, carnal mind and mortal mind, into soap bubble. <laughs> but anything that will make us lose our fear of the source of error will accomplish the purpose of the development of our spiritual consciousness, and nothing else will. There is no way to attain spiritual consciousness while having two powers. For spiritual consciousness is the consciousness of one power. And that power of a spiritual nature, not material and not mental. Whatever it is that trains us into an entirely new thought, a new state of consciousness, a new state of being, so that we can look upon all of the forms of evil, whether they are thrown at us under the guise of drug addiction, alcoholism, incurable diseases, and throw them back into the one word or one term, carnal mind, mortal mind, armor flesh, fleshly mind, and thereby lose all fear of them then you find you have attained a greater awareness of spiritual consciousness, a greater attainment of the consciousness itself. As you know, most of you have been confronted in one way or another, some time or another, with some friend who has said, I have a headache, and you've done a little work about it, and the headache disappeared. If you ever ask yourself how it came about, the answer is you're not very much afraid of headaches. And therefore, it didn't concern you too much. You weren't afraid they were going to die. You weren't afraid they were going to go insane. You weren't afraid that uh, they'd go unconscious. It was just a headache. And therefore, with no fear of it, you turned within, you realized a few truths, and that was the end of it, and probably was the end of the headache. Ah, uh, yes. That must be our attitude in the final analysis. When we are confronted with any and every phase of discord, including the last enemy, and are able to say, as Jesus did, he's not dead, he's just asleep. Let's wake him up. Oh, I realize I'm talking now very absolutely and uh, not asking to be pushed into that position too quickly. But nevertheless, as we grow, so we are asked for help on this, that, or the other thing and gradually approach each and every problem without fear. Without fear, in the same way that we approach the simple headache oh, it's just a headache, well, let's do something, and then we'll have our little realization, and it's done. Once we realize that the name or nature of the discord, physical, mental, moral, financial, is of that same nature as the simple headache, so that we do not fear it, then we do the same thing. We go within, have our brief meditation, 
receive our click and we drop it. But remember this, that to do that and then be sitting by waiting for the telephone to ring every minute how the patient's getting along is uh, to prove that you have not attained the principle. To fear to give a treatment to your child because it's your child means you haven't attained the realization of the principle. Once you understand this principle, it makes no difference whether it's your child or somebody else's or your parent or somebody else's because you're not dealing with persons. You're dealing with a state of nothingness which you have realized to be a state of nothingness. That's what you're dealing with, not the person, not the patient. They don't enter it. They're merely the beneficiary of your understanding, if you have understanding. They're going to be the victim of your lack of understanding if you don't have the understanding. But it isn't the patient that you think about, nor is it the disease, nor the unemployment, nor the poverty, nor any other phase of the error in their life. What you are thinking of is the principle of your work. And the principle is God and an infinite God. And the principle is that we are being tempted by a million different pictures, all of which emanate from the same old devil or mortal mind or arm of flesh or fleshly mind, and all of which represents the arm of flesh or nothingness. In proportion as you can face the claims that way, you can meet them. In proportion as you can understand this principle for yourself, even if you can't do your own work, and that probably is the most difficult of all, at least you make it easy for the practitioner to help you as long as you aren't sitting around fearing that which you've already understood to be nothing more nor less than a mental imposition. Now, all of these mental impositions come through the human mind. And therefore, it is necessary to understand that this so-called mind of man, this mind that knows good and evil, is not a power, not a power in the sense of creating evil or being evil. Try to understand the true nature of your mind and you'll be at peace forever. God gave us our mind as an instrument of awareness. With our mind, we become aware of that which is. We go to school and learn that two times two are four. We don't make it so with our mind. We merely learn through the mind that it is so. The mind is an instrument like the body is. In our present state of existence, I walk to the door and therefore I use my body and especially my feet and my limbs. If I give or receive, I use my hands. These are my instruments. But if I want to learn something, I use my mind. But I don't use my mind to create anything. Do you understand that? I don't make of my mind a creative power. I make of it a state of awareness. With my mind, I'm aware of your presence. But I can't, with my mind, make you present. That is one of the errors of metaphysics, that people believe that by mentalizing, they can create patients and students and followers. That's a lot of nonsense. If you do it, you'll lose them, sure, in fate because somebody else will probably do it with deeper concentration than you and take them away from you. You do not mentalize to get anything, supply, 
transportation, health. Your mind wasn't given to you for that purpose. It was given to you as an instrument of awareness through which you learn. You become aware of all that is, whether it is of art or literature or music or your business or your profession. Whatever it is, your mind is the instrument through which you learn it. You don't create those things. You learn them. You don't create with the mind. But too many have been taught that thoughts are things, and therefore all you have to do is think a thought and get a thing. Don't do it. It's a dangerous practice. It can be done on some small scale, but it's dangerous. I have known people who have used their minds to work themselves into certain positions, certain places in life, and I've also seen the sorrow that comes to them, because someday or other they lose. Someday or other a change comes. Someday or other somebody smarter or stronger comes into the picture, and then they found that the house they've built crumbles. Now. We don't create any, anyone's health with our mind, but we can sit down in a listening attitude and become aware of the health that is omnipresent. If we sit down in a listening attitude, receptive, peacefully, quietly, in the realization of God as the only power, we'll only be still a very short while until we'll receive through the mind, an assurance that all is well, or this is...